well. So what I'll talk about today is a, a variant. Okay, a variant uh, is uh, something that was added to the C++ STL with C++ 17, but it was actually uh, to some extent already. Little bit uh, what variant is and uh, uh, how people usually uh, use it and uh, a little bit about the common cases where people will go and use variant for. And then I will dive into some specific use cases that mostly have to do with the, the relationship between uh, the C++ uh, uh, variants and unions that uh, hopefully many of you already know and remember not just from C++ but also from C. And I'll show you a little bit of uh, uh, the, the, the commonalities and differences and that I will uh, also unions. Uh, show you some tricks and tools uh, that I use to maybe bridge the, the gap between those two things called the intrusive variants and streams of variants. And uh, I'll close with something that also related to variants, which it has to do with the performance and devirtualization of uh, uh, virtual function calls uh, towards the end. Great. So uh, first of all, what is a variant? So uh, c++reference.com uh, says that the, uh, a variant is a class template that represents a type safe union. And boost.org, which had variant for much longer time, calls it a, a safe, generic, stack-based, discriminated union container. Okay, so what does it all mean? It basically means that it's very much like a union, but it's safe. The reason that a variant is safe is because it knows what type it is, okay? And because of that, it, it's much harder to make mistakes when using a variant. So in the example that we can see in this slide, and uh, a C style code uh, that uh, you, can, you can write uh, even before C++17, you could have a union of an int and a double, which basically has either an int or a double, and a function foo could take such a union and access uh, it as an integer uh, and print it to a CD out, for example. And uh, on the right, you can see the C++17 variant approach where I uh, use a variant of an int of a and a double, and I can use the get method to access a specific uh, member. And unlike uh, uh, with C and, and with unions, the get uh, method will actually throw an exception if the type that the variant has is not an int. Okay, and uh, another way to access a union, which is considered more, uh, I guess, sophisticated, is the uh, uh, std visit. With std visit, you can see I can give it a, a lambda function or anything that, uh, that is callable. And here I give it a generic lambda. And uh, what, what will happen here, this std visit will sort of work like a switch statement. It will, will actually call uh, and print out to see out either an int or a double based on what's held inside the variant var that I can have here, okay? So that's the basic idea. And std visit, by the way, is guaranteed to be constant time complexity, uh, O of one complexity as long as uh, we give it just one variant as an argument. And the, typically, a TD visit is uh, implemented using a, a virtual table or a jump table. Um, so that's uh, a little bit about uh, what variant is. And uh, to go a little deeper into the uh, bits and bytes, you can see, and uh, probably many of you already know this, uh, that uh, unlike a struct or a tuple that uh, holds all the different members that it has and different uh, addresses in memory, and can actually have uh, different values for each of the members, unions and variants are not like that. Uh, they have and they store just the size of the maximal or, or largest member that it can have. And uh, at any point in time, you can either use it for one of the members or, or another, nothing else. With variant, you can see that uh, on top of uh, keeping this union information, there's another tag that's being held uh, that tells the variant which of the different members is currently occupying the memory space. Okay, we can also see that there's a, a pending involved. Uh, you know, C, C and C++ uh, keeps track of alignment of their of various types. And for that reason, sometimes the different members uh, or and even the tag can actually occupy more space than it, it needs just for alignment reasons. Okay, so uh, this is uh, what variant is and what, how do people use it? So I looked around in uh, YouTube and uh, in other like, conferences and uh, on, around the internet of how people usually um, present and, and show uh, uses for variants. And it's, I have to say it's quite, uh, uh, quite diverse. There are a lot of uh, reasons to use variants. The typical things that I found 
and I'll try to go over them a little bit uh, in the following slides, are state machines, uh, the use of uh, value semantics for dynamic types, meaning uh, the ability to have different types, uh, but in a single memory space that is on the stack and can be moved and copied just like any value type. Um, another more uh, like a trivial or, or a reduced uh, usage of variant is uh, to use it uh, for either an object or nothing, or either an object or, or a failure. So expected of T is uh, something that people use to either have a, an object of type T or an exception or an indication of failure. Similarly, uh, optional that was also added to the standard is either a type T or a nothing, okay? Um, and many times when people uh, discuss them, they, you know, converse them or they, they talk about the relationship between them and the and variance, okay? Uh, yet another common uh, use case for variance is to talk about runtime dispatch and about uh, alternative mechanisms to the uh, well-known uh, use of uh, variant, uh, virtual functions. So that's another thing that if you want more information on, you can probably find a lot of talks in YouTube about. And uh, lastly, there are people who discuss uh, variants when they talk about pattern matching, which is actually a whole new different uh, uh, approach for writing code. And, and there are talks about trying to uh, add pattern matching to the C++ language itself with new uh, uh, capabilities and new uh, powers, uh, new tools. So let's dive deep. So here we can see, uh, you know, a slide from a talk uh, uh, from Germany from uh, Meeting C++ 2018, where uh, uh, variants were uh, introduced uh, with a description of a state machine. It's quite uh, reasonable to use uh, uh, variants when working with state machines because a state machine, as we might remember from university, is something that uh, can always have just one of, a, of several states. And this uh, relies, lends itself very well to variants which again hold just one of various uh, members. One of the things that we can see uh, in this example that uh, uh, Nikolai, Nikolai gave uh, for a state machine for, uh, I think it was uh, like a spacecraft in a, a video game, is that some of the states are actually similar to each other and have commonalities. So you can see the circling and shooting uh, from center uh, uh, states, they both have a double called M times since last shot. So there is some commonality. If uh, Nikolai tried to maybe implement his state machine uh, using uh, virtual functions, he might have uh, had some uh, base and derived classes in order to uh, make the commonality more clear. Mm -hmm. But with variants, you typically don't do uh, base and derived classes. You just put the different states, and the variant holds just one of them. But technically, it can be done. Okay. Another example uh, for state machines from CppCon 2018. Um, again, we can see a state machine for uh, uh, a connection between uh, two uh, network elements. And again, we can see uh, STD variant is used to uh, have the different types of events, and different types of states. It's all very, very uh, simple and very elegant way to uh, represent either or, which is typical in state machine uh, operations. Okay. Another uh, typical use case for state for variants is uh, commands. Uh, some of you might uh, know uh, the command design pattern from the uh, Gang of Four uh, design pattern uh, book from the 90s. And uh, uh, basically, commands is, is an object that uh, can you can pass around and it uh, simply signifies an action that needs to be uh, done, done or needs to be taken. Um, the fact that commands usually uh, being passed around from uh, one component in a system to another one, uh, sometimes between threads or even between uh, components across the network, really uh, means that it's, easy, it's important to have commands be something that can be moved, copied, and serialized. And uh, the fact that uh, variants are stack-based objects that can be, uh, uh, you know, that can be used with the standard uh, operator overloading with assignment, move assignment, etc., really helps people when they want to uh, uh, use one of different commands and pass them around, unlike, uh, uh, I guess, pointers to objects where you need to keep track of lifetimes, need to do uh, things like uh, smart pointers, etc. So that's another use case that's typical for uh, variants. And if you want, you can look at this uh, uh, YouTube video for more details. Yet another uh, thing that uh, you know that we can see, and uh, this is my first chance to mention Andre Alexandrescu, one of my uh, personal uh, gurus for C++, is on his talk from 2018, where he describes uh, uh, expected. And I don't know if you know it, but there's 
a big move to try and add the expected to the C++ uh, standard, maybe uh, on C++ 23 or, or, or maybe a little later on, as a way to uh, represent something which is either uh, a result or a failure. Okay? And here we can see Alex Rodesco saying that his idea and his uh, motivation for uh, expected came when he uh, looked at uh, a variant and thought that this is something that's uh, nice and uh, as he says, it's painfully close to what uh, he wants for, uh, uh, for expected uh, itself. Okay? And uh, as well as optional, something that's already in the standard, very nice and very uh, simple. And here, uh, Nevin Lieber, who was uh, uh, part of the committee that, and, part, and did a lot of the work for uh, standardizing uh, uh, variant, basically uh, here in this slide he says that uh, an optional is a refinement of variant, as mentioned, either uh, a type or nothing. Okay, and uh, another uh, common use case that you can look up if you like is using variant for runtime dispatch. And in this uh, video over here from 2019, Inbal, uh, who's another uh, very uh, smart and uh, talented uh, Israeli, presented uh, uh, again a way to use a variant and SD visit as a way uh, to basically uh, implement a constant time jump table similar to virtual uh, tables, but without uh, the, the mechanisms of uh, derived classes and with a lot more flexibility. And just a few months ago, uh, um, we also saw a, a class, uh, probably uh, you, we all know, uh, uh, describing the various uh, techniques that people can use for doing a runtime dispatch and uh, giving them, uh, uh, telling us what's good and bad on, on the different types. And he also uh, presents a, a variant, he says that on, for many, many aspects, it's, it can be a good choice when uh, someone wants uh, to do a runtime dispatch between various types. You can also see, by the way, that uh, uh, Klaus also uh, differentiates between uh, the uh, standard visitor and standard visit for, for variant, as well as uh, uh, Michael Park's variant. Michael Park is a talented developer who's working a lot in this field, and he's implemented his own uh, variant uh, library. And uh, one of his main focuses, uh, as far as I understand, is pattern matching. And so here's another talk that if you want, you can uh, uh, look at related to pattern matching, where Michael basically uh, shows us uh, how a typical use case of a visit, where one would uh, basically write a visit uh, function similar to uh, a switch statement, right, where we have uh, various uh, operations, various lambdas for the different types of uh, alternatives that the variant might have. And uh, he also, uh, shows us that it's quite common and can be quite uh, nice to uh, merge this uh, uh, this model of work with the uh, structured bindings from C++17 where one could uh, whenever they whenever he reaches this uh, for example k statement of a specific alternative of the variant he uses uh, the structured bindings to extract the specific uh, members of this uh, of, of the alternative that he uses and can uh, work with that and Basically, Michael Park is advocating to try and make this type of uh, uh, usage of trying to write a sort of like a switch statements, but not uh, based on values, but based on types and based on the members of types as part of the language, of a nicer part of the language. Um, Michael uh, even showed in his reference for someone saying that uh, STD visit is everything wrong with modern C++. I don't think uh, he means or anyone really means that uh, uh, variants are, uh, are wrong or bad, but uh, I think uh, one of the meanings is that SDV visit gives a lot of power, but it's complicated and cumbersome. And that's one of the reasons where, uh, why he's proposing to add an actual uh, new keywords to the language. I think uh, um, inspect is the word that he's uh, suggesting, uh, to do something that's like SDV visit, but actually part of the language that will make things more uh, uh, easy to understand and actually also a little more similar to uh, what we can see in other languages such I think as Haskell and as, as well as Rust. So you're welcome to look at that talk as well if that sounds interesting to you. And even uh, Nevin Lieber um, mentioned that uh, Bjorn Strasrup uh, considers pattern matching as uh, an, a nice uh, addition to the language and he uh, also uh, thought that uh, in, uh, on top of the existing STD visit mechanism um, there should be a place for actual pattern matching in the language. Okay, so that was a little bit of an overview 
of various use cases that you can find online. I won't talk about them anymore, but feel free. I really encourage you to go and look at them, especially if the use cases that I mentioned are uh, relevant to what you work on or to problems that you try to solve. Okay, so now let's uh, dive deep to the uh, actual problems that I want to uh, discuss, which is the relationship between variants and unions. Okay, in the line of work that I do, I work, uh, as mentioned, in uh, uh, financial trading, in low latency trading. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, you know desire to be very close to the bits and very close to uh, to the actual memory representation of objects, and that's why people uh, get uh, attracted to unions a lot. And but uh, using unions can be nice and very low level, but it's also a little bit unsafe. And uh, in this talk, I'll try to give some ideas on how to how we can add safety that we can borrow from variants into unions. Okay, so why is uh, a variant uh, so safe? The safety of the variant comes from the fact that uh, the tag that is held is private. There's no actual way to change the tag inside the variant except by using the assignment operator. So if I call the assignment operator on a variant with a specific uh, type, one of the alternatives, then automatically the tag gets changed. There's no other way to, uh, to affect or to change the, the tag. Uh, and that means that there, there, there's no chance of errors. There's no chance that I will put one type of object inside my variant, and then I try to access it as another different type. And the compiler uh, knows uh, what type it is, and it also knows all of the different alternatives, which can give us safety and also sometimes performance. So that's what the, why, why the uh, variant is, is safer than union. However, the fact that this is tag is so private and so out of reach means that it's very hard uh, to control the bits and the bytes, and it's very hard for uh, people that use variants to really understand what's going on under the hood and to affect it if they like. Okay, so here's a little bit of an example of the, the trade-off between knowing what's under the hood compared to, uh, uh, to using the safety of variants. Okay, so the code uh, here that I'm presenting is a C-style code. You can see I have a, a union of uh, three different types of identity cards. Uh, you know, a, a person that is a citizen, they can have a national ID. A person that is a tourist came from another country, they have a passport number. And the robot might have a, a UUID that uh, uh, identifies the, the robot. And the, the check ID function uh, uh, that I uh, wrote here uses a C-style uh, switch statement to try and uh, uh, accept an identity card as well as a type. And based on that, check whether uh, uh, the ID is valid or not. Okay, um, the code that you can see here, I deliberately implemented some bugs which, uh, which compilers will not catch. Some of the bugs that I've added are uh, actually uh, things that can be, uh, I guess, uh, converted into or can, can create warnings, but the C++ standards uh, allows this code to compile. Okay, so I guess this is a good time to maybe stop a little bit and give you, first of all, uh, a chance to uh, maybe think or guess what the, the three bugs that I've entered to, to the code are, uh, as well as if you have any uh, questions or thoughts about variants, this may be, uh, be happy to hear. Okay, so, so yeah, let me uh, try and describe the three bugs that, uh, uh, that I planted in the code here. Okay, so first of all, um, you can see that uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, citizen case on the switch statement, although the case is for a citizen, but I incorrectly accessed the passport member, which is just relevant for a tourist. Okay, and uh, again, the compiler won't stop me when I do it. Okay, the second thing is that I forgot about the robot. Okay, what about the robot? In, in this case over here, uh, the, the check function will just uh, uh, succeed. It won't do any check because I forgot one of the cases, and the compiler. Uh, doesn't know about the relationship between the identity card and the ID type enum, so it will not uh, uh, help me with anything. And the last bug, which is uh, kind of uh, uh, strange that we keep uh, living with it, but it's due to backwards compatibility, has to do with the break state with the break statement that switch functions or switch uh, users uh, typically have, but uh, you still have to write them, and by default there is no break and there's just a pass through. Okay. So how would we do this uh, code in C++17, and how would we make it safer? So happily, as in the visit function, and if I'm in uh, C++, I can uh, 
also where maybe call a method called the check on, on the uh, class. And if my identity card is a variant of the three different types, then everything is uh, much uh, uh, nicer and, uh, and, and easy. I just uh, do a visit with a check and the visit function will force the correct switch, st switch statement to happen in constant time. The compiler will not let me uh, access the incorrect member. The compiler will not let me uh, uh, no, compile if any of the different uh, alternatives does not have a check method. So things are much safer. On the other hand, there is no way for me to tell uh, uh, my compiler or the code anything about this uh, ID type enum. Okay, the, the, the tag that uh, the compiler chooses to put in the variant is a tag that's private to the, to the variant. Compiler chooses how to do it, and uh, there's no uh, real way for me to really connect uh, the enum with the variant uh, automatically. Okay, and sometimes I don't need to, but uh, sometimes, especially when I look at the uh, old C style code, those enums are you know, part of the definition of, uh, of unions, and I would like to use them. Okay, so this is a, a nice, uh, I think, example of the differences between unions and variants and why variants are safer, but what uh, I lose when I uh, use them. Um, and it seems that uh, everyone, you know, based on this example, will try to move all of their code from switch statements to visit statements. But uh, the reality is that not so uh, so clear cut, usually because the uh, existing code that uses unions isn't so uh, problematic as the example that I gave you on the left. It's just a straw man. Typically, people that use uh, uh, unions, they work much uh, more safely. And here's how people actually uh, uh, code in C. Okay, and even in C++ when they use unions. A typical way is to put the tag right in front of the union whenever I use it. Okay, because uh, as mentioned, it's pretty common for people that uh, access the union to need the tag. So even without a variant, it was quite common to have structs like uh, the example here, where a struct will have the type, and right after it, a union of the different uh, values and different alternatives. And this is how people usually write code which is then not much safer from the compiler perspective, but it makes the code easier to read and makes the code thus a little less uh, error prone. And usually people don't make uh, the types of mistakes from my previous slide. Okay. Um, as, as another uh, approach that people sometimes do when they uh, write uh, code using unions, instead of uh, having the type outside of the union and then a union of members, they can have a single union of different alternatives but each alternative just has the same prefix of fields. So all the, all the alternatives here, both the header, the citizen, and the tourist, they all start with this uh, type member, okay? And uh, it's uh, totally fine in, in C, and also, by the way, in C++, to access the type member, either by accessing the, card, uh, the card's uh, header member, or citizen member, or tourist member. So that's uh, uh, something that people do many times. Uh, I don't know if you're how much you're used to these uh, approaches and uh, if you usually put the type outside of the union or as one of the fields in the union. I find that uh, both approaches uh, can be can make sense in, in different times. OK, as time goes by, usually in existing code bases, I, I, I see I tend to see that the header or the commonalities between uh, the various alternatives grows and grows. People see that sometimes uh, they, they need more data that is common to all the different types of, uh, of alternatives. So even in our examples, like you can have a, an expiration date or a photo to each and every identity that's part of the card, regardless of uh, you know, whether it has an ID number or a passport number. And uh, how would you usually uh, implement that? So one typical way that I see, especially in code that's imported from C, is uh, using uh, preprocessor macros. Okay, so, so I see many times code that has uh, one macro with the different uh, uh, fields that are common. And then uh, a union will have different structs that all have, need to have the exact same common fields in their prefix. And it's important to make sure that the fields in the prefix are all in the start of the uh, struct and all in the same in the exact same order, because that way we can uh, go and uh, access those fields without even knowing what the type is. This is uh, something that you can also see when you write a C code. And, it typically, you know, it's maybe not very pretty to use the preprocessor, but it works. 
Okay, so here I've tried, when you look at that, you see code that is uh, much nicer and much less error prone, but still the compiler will not really help us. Okay, so the typical memory layout that we'll see in this, uh, when people use this uh, type of code, will be a tag and, and after it a union. And the, the code lends itself very well to functions that accept this uh, whole identity card, and then they can do switch statements based on the type, etc. But still, if uh, someone makes a mistake, then uh, there's no way, uh, there's no way, uh, uh, I guess, uh, obligation by the compiler to stop them and tell them that they made a mistake. And this is where I try to uh, maybe think how we can bring uh, C++, uh, I guess, variant security and safety into the uh, union world, but also keeping this uh, same memory layout of a tag and following that tag, the uh, union itself, where I actually control the enum of ID type and the, and, the, and the exact memory layout that I use for. Okay, why, why is that important? Uh, there are many reasons why I, I think it's, people want to keep the, the C layout and not touch it. And mainly it's not just uh, due to standard or regular backwards compatibility of people being afraid. It's also that it's quite common uh, for this type of uh, memory layout to be used not just inside a program, but also outside of a program when I send the information, binary information over the network, or when I store information on disk and want to read it uh, back up. The C standard has a quite good uh, definition of how uh, you know, a struct, like we described, is going to be in memory. Okay? There are obviously some uh, peculiarities regarding uh, you know, Little Indian versus Big Indian, and uh, some uh, platforms might have a different size of int, etc. But typically, if a, if a single binary uh, wrote a, a, a single layout, you can recompile it and you can be sure that the layout in memory will be the same and you can and it's okay to read and write from from files from networks these types of things and uh here you can see that uh, uh, i've even looked and found that there are various you know protocols file formats and serialization libraries that use this type of uh, uh, convention where if they want to send either one of different uh, types they will send a tag or an enum and follow that with just the one type that they want uh, and not uh, send everything uh, else. So for that reason, uh, using a STD variant is not so trivial uh, when we're trying to interact with older application and you want to interact with C style code, okay? Uh, so my uh, approach that I will present in the next slide will be something that looks like a variant, but uh, gives you uh, the ability to use this uh, nice uh, layout that, that you might have already on your disk or, or you might have already in packets that are flying inside the network where your program lives. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, I forgot to tell you a little bit about, uh, about something which is a C++ standard. Okay, so um, I told you a lot about uh, this structure of the, the union and, and different uh, fields, etc. cetera, but uh, um, one might ask, is it uh, safe to put uh, you know, an int inside the, the union and then access it as a char? Or is it safe to, uh, you know, to actually look at the at members inside the union without actually understanding what the tag was and how, and what, and how assignment worked? And uh, to uh, be frank, the C++ standard is actually quite nice. And the C++ standard already knows that people use this type of uh, layout and these type of structures to communicate between uh, uh, other languages. And that's why the C++ standard has a, a concept called standard layout class. Okay, many of you probably heard of a, a POD or trivial classes or uh, maybe uh, trivially uh, copyable classes. Uh, there are various uh, types of classes that uh, the standard, uh, I guess, defines. And one of the types that the standard defines is called a standard layout class. What is a standard layout class? A standard layout class is First of all, a useful way for communicating with code written in other programming languages. So exactly for our use case, the C++ standard knows and thinks about this problem that I presented. And they put various constraints. They said, if I have a class that has no virtual functions and no virtual table, and uh, all of its uh, members that are not static have a single access control. So either everything is private or everything is public or everything is protected. And uh, it also, uh, requires that uh, 
all the non-static members have to be in the same class. So if I have a class hierarchy and, and a class that derives from another class and derives from another class, only one of the classes inside this chain can have uh, uh, non-static members. If uh, more than one has non-static members, then this hierarchy is no longer considered standard layout. But if I meet all of these constraints, if I have a class that meets all of the constraints, then I can then I can happily say that I am standard layout, and I can even use static assert to make sure that my member is a standard uh, 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 layout. And uh, if I'm a standard layout, then uh, the uh, then the uh, C++ standard will guarantee that uh, I can actually go and use this uh, uh, the members inside the, my class or my union with uh, very good uh, guarantees about where each of the members resides in memory, and I can go and look at and even do some types of reinterpret casts between one standard layout class and another. Okay, so um, this is something that we can do in C++ 17. Uh, you probably know that many of those, uh, uh, you know, colon colon value types have uh, been shortened into underscore v, and uh, with that uh, in mind, I can actually do very very uh, neat things. So here's another uh, a quote from the standard. In the standard layout union, with an up, oh, excuse me, with an active member struct type t. Okay, so I have a union where the current active assigned value is of type T1. So the standard said that it is permitted to read a non-static data member of another mem of another union member type T2 if the, the, the member M is part of the common initial sequence of T1 and T2. Okay, so what does it mean? If I have a union of two types, two, and th those two types, T1 and T2, they are both standard layout, they also can have a common initial sequence. So the first few fields in T1 and T2 that are common to each other are exactly the same uh, uh, order and the same types of fields, then the standard allows to access one of them, even if the data that's actually uh, held in, and was stored inside the union was from the other type. And that is very cool. That is why it's allowed and it's okay to access not just the ID type, but also uh, the photos and all the other common types without even knowing what the tag is. And it's totally uh, safe, totally legit, and it's not undefined behavior. In C++ uh, 20, we also uh, received a new uh, contextual function called is corresponding member. And is corresponding member, member, I can actually give it two members of two different uh, uh, classes. And uh, the compiler will tell me whether these two classes are both standard layout. And those two members are part of this common initial sequence. Okay, and that way, if I like, I can ensure and safely know that it's okay to access the type member, excuse me, of a union, regard, even before I know and check if my union has a header or a citizen. Okay, so uh, uh, does anyone have any questions about all this uh, standard these language and how uh, you know how it's legal to use uh, unions in this way? Okay, cool. So, without uh, much uh, uh, wait, I'll give you uh, my uh, suggested uh, proposal or my suggested solution, which is called an intrusive variant. Okay, so just to remind ourselves, we have a union uh, which has the uh, three different alternatives. One is the header, the other is the citizen, the third is a tourist, and they all have uh, this common uh, prefix, which is the, the type itself, which is the tag. And uh, this is our structure. And if instead of using the union in the C style code, I can use what I call an intrusive variant. So what's an intrusive variant? It's something that I want to have the exact same layout, but be safer. So what I'll do, the intrusive variant will be a variadic template, and I'll give it uh, all the details it needs to make sure that it works safely. So I'll tell it, OK, the, the enum that you're going to use is ID type. OK, I'm going to tell it what is the enum and where the tag uh, what the type of the tag is, as well as what the offset it has from the start of the uh, of the union. Okay, so uh, with this, uh, with these two arguments, I can tell my intrusive variant uh, w in which offset it can find the the tag and what type the tag is, and then I can go and start telling my variant what are the different alternatives. 
Okay, so in this case, I have two alternatives. One is the uh, citizen enum, the other is the tourist enum, and the, the two different alternatives are two different classes. And with this uh, variant, I basically told the compiler a lot of information. And with that information, I can actually do things like visit on my uh, intrusive variant, which will be safe, which will actually be as safe as, uh, as, as visitation, uh, just, just like I like it, okay? I have to say that, uh, uh, as you can see, the, the ID type is still public, okay? It, I cannot make it uh, a private because, as mentioned, one of the you know, requirements for standard layout is that everything is either public together or private together. And so there's still not full safety. Someone can go and, and trick me and put a, a, you know, a citizen inside my uh, union or inside my intrusive variant and later on go and uh, forcefully change the type. But if uh, people you know, work like they're supposed to, then uh, the intrusive uh, variant will guard them and they can use it safely with, uh, with STD, with, with fun visit functions, etc., just like they would with the STL standard, but with the memory layout that they're used to and they, they might need for backwards compatibility. Okay, well, if we go to C20, we can have an even nicer approach. Oh, wait, even uh, uh, for, for C17, um, we can just uh, change a little bit our uh, classes and add uh, like a, a static uh, uh, type def for, for each of the enums in, in each of the unions, okay? So I can have uh, each of the each of the alternatives have a my type type def that tells what its own type is, and with that uh, uh, approach, it's a little simpler to write uh, uh, my intrusive variant this way, okay? Uh, and as I mentioned, you have the full control of uh, what the type is and full control of what the offset is, where it resides inside your uh, memory layout. Still, you can do visit in constant time and, and make everything uh, uh, look like C++ and look uh, and, and behave safer. And the compiler will catch many of the issues that uh, might uh, hurt you. Okay, uh, because uh, I control the type, I can and, and the tag, I I can make things uh, very very uh, or much less efficient compared to uh, what the compiler will do. Okay, so for example, if uh, the different types for the different uh, alternatives have a uh, you know very very different values so maybe citizen colon colon my type if that's uh, like a small number and tourists colon colon my type is a very very large number then the implementation of intrusive variant might be might create a, a larger lookup table or a larger jump table for the uh, constant time uh, uh, operation but still it, it's doable and it's uh, safe and, and sound okay so that's intrusive variant. And as I mentioned, with the C20, I can go and uh, um, also uh, tell the compiler a little bit more and do something that's a little safer. And I can tell it uh, which, are the, which are my members, my two types that I use, and which are their values that, that correspond to them. And this uh, decal safe intrusive variant is just a, a a function that, uh, or a template function that uses ADL and the uh, argument dependent lookup to basically extract uh, the, the different types of the uh, of the variant. Okay, that I, it will know that I have a citizen and a tourist, and it will also check using static asserts that the two different members, the citizen colon colon type and tourist colon colon type, are indeed part of the common uh, prefix that I can use, and that way. I can have a much uh, cleaner and safer uh, way to to create my intrusive variant and also make sure that I don't need to put uh, any uh, offset of, I don't need to uh, specify by myself the different offsets into each alternative. I just give it the types and this uh, decal safe uh, intrusive variant uses static asserts to make sure that I didn't make a mistake and that all those uh, tags reside in exactly the same place in memory. Okay, so that's uh, the basic idea. And you can see that this, uh, I think there might be even nicer ways to, uh, uh, to implement this, or maybe I can, uh, I can use uh, something that's uh, more like a generic lambda in order to, I guess, point into citizen colon colon my type and tourist colon colon my type, but I'm not sure about it. Okay, so this, these are, this is some nice syntactic sugaring that's 
related to uh, the CWAS20 capabilities that add safety and make sure that uh, I can declare my intrusive variants in a better way. Okay, so this is, uh, I think, one uh, approach that uh, I use uh, sometimes at work. And it, uh, well, in work, we don't yet have CWAS20, but I use the approaches from the previous slide. And it makes my life after that much easier where I can go and do visitation and I don't need to write my own switch statements as I work with the, the same memory layout that I am used to from legacy and for other reasons. Okay, let's talk about uh, uh, this, uh, the safety that I received. Okay, so an intrusive variant has a, a safe uh, visit function and it knows the exact uh, connection between uh, the, every type and its tag, which is very, very good. Uh, but still, you can see there's quite a lot of uh, boilerplate, and there can be some, especially in the C++ 17 versions, some places for bugs. And when we talked a little earlier, I told you that uh, there are many cases where the different uh, uh, types have commonalities, and it's not just the header. Sometimes we have several fields that are common between the different uh, types. So that's why I thought it can make sense to put uh, the common uh, members of all the different alternatives inside the base class. Okay, consider a case where the tourist and the uh, uh, citizen and, and the robot have the same base class, and the base class is the header. That can give me a lot of uh, more safety. I can use the, the ease base of utility to make sure that all the different alternatives have the same base class. I can use uh, uh, various uh, tools like decal type to get the exact uh, members that I want, and things will be much safer. The only problem is that uh, this isn't part of the standard. This isn't standard layout. If as soon as my union or my variant has uh, different uh, types that have, uh, you know, they're all derived from something that has members, then some, suddenly it's not standard layout. Suddenly nothing is guaranteed from, in terms of, uh, you know, being uh, safe and sound and not uh, undefined behavior. But generally I can tell you that it works. I also use that in my place of work. And most compilers, when you do, uh, uh, when you derive the, the base classes, are basically just a header at the start of everything. And this is uh, uh, what I call variant of base, okay? So variant of base, you can see I have a base class, which is the header, and the different alternatives are just derived from the header. And the fact that they derived from it, it makes sure and it ensures that uh, everything is, uh, that, that, you know, the, all the types of the header reside uh, in the same location. I can, I can use them with safety. And each of the, uh, those derived uh, alternatives can also have a static const expert um, member, which is the enum value, which, is, which contains the type itself, as well as other members that it likes. And the variant of base is a utility that I uh, created to basically wrap that around into something that looks like a variant. Okay, so variant of base, I can tell it, hey, I have a few alternatives. They all derive from ID header, okay? And uh, all of them, I can, if I, if I reinterpret Castor, if I look at them as an ID header, I can use this first lambda to get at runtime the exact type that they hold. And I can also use a const expert generic lambda to get the exact type from in compile time of the uh, each and every alternative. Okay, so this first uh, lambda can be used in runtime to check what is the type of the, or the tag of, of a specific uh, uh, variant or a specific memory uh, region. And the second lambda is actually used in compile time. Uh, you can see it's generic to basically fill uh, the different uh, values inside my lookup tables to make sure that in this way, I know for each and every of the alternatives, and here I have two alternatives, citizen and tourist, exactly what uh, uh, inner values I should expect if I see them in runtime. Okay, so that's a variant of base. As I mentioned, it's not a, uh, completely uh, conforming to the standard, but uh, this uh, usually works in most, uh, I guess, x86 compilers, and uh, it really makes, uh, uh, I think, uh, life very easy. And again, with this declaration, uh, the ID with base type look, acts much like a variant. I can do a visitation on it, I can work on it, and I get uh, a lot of the safety. And it also uses uh, static assertions to make sure that all the different alternatives they all derive from ID header. And uh, obviously the generic lambdas and the lambda itself will not compile if I try to access an incorrect member 
or remember in the wrong uh, location. So that's a variant of base, which is a second alternative, which is, I think, uh, easier to use, but not uh, standard conforming for, uh, again, using the same memory layout, but with a nicer or, or safer type of code. OK, so this is my second alternative. Uh, another uh, uh, good place, I think, uh, for questions, if you have any, uh, hopefully you more or less understand what I, where I'm going for, OK? So, um, without, so I'm running a little bit out of time, so let's move on from uh, these two uh, nice alternatives of using a variant. Yeah, so, OK, so uh, this is, again, uh, these two utilities to use C++ and C++ variant type a code with the, the old C style memory layout. And now let's move to something a little different, which is streams or arrays of variants. Okay. Many times in the code that I uh, use, I don't have just uh, one, uh, uh, you know, variant that I use. I need to access, you know, a stream where people want to send me many, many entities or many, many commands one after another. Okay. Now, if I put a variant, um, I guess, inside a vector, so I have an STL vector of, of a variant. Things are pretty uh, simple and, and, and straightforward, right? I have uh, a variant after a variant after a variant. They all reside one after another uh, in memory, each one with its own tag. Uh, but unfortunately, the size of each of them is the full size of, of the variant, which is the maximum of all the uh, alternatives. Okay, so in this example over here, the first one is a citizen, the second is a robot, the last is also a citizen, but each of them uh, take, uh, take all the space that it needs uh, for the worst case scenario. And even if I go for an intrusive variant from my previous slides, it won't really help. You know, the tag gets moved around from the end to the start or something, but still the intrusive variant, its size, if I, as long as I use a, a, the STL's vector, uh, the size of each and every member has the exact same size. And it's, uh, it can give a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, benefits, but it's also a little bit, uh, uh, I guess, wasteful in terms of memory. And also, it's not the way that uh, uh, we usually interact with old C style code. Okay, in C style, in the real world, as I mentioned, if you look at the uh, objects and, and file uh, formats, etc., once they give me a tag, they'll immediately just put the exact number of bytes that they want for the specific entity that they want to put for this specific alternative. And they, so, if a citizen needs fewer bytes than a robot, then after the citizen's tag, I'll put just those bytes and move on to the next tag and to the next tag, etc. And this way, everything is more condensed. Everything is more straightforward. And this is the way usually people actually, you know, store or, or transmit data that is uh, sort of like a, a variant, uh, but in the real world. And uh, the question is, how would someone uh, look at this type of data if I have it in, in RAM, if I read it from a file or received it uh, over the network, how would I work with it in a variant-like fashion or in a C++-like fashion. And for that uh, uh, problem, I implemented another nice thing, which is called the Condensed Variant Iterator. So what's a Condensed Variant Iterator? It's basically uh, what, it's, uh, what its name uh, mentions. It's something that looks like a, an iterator. It's a forward iterator. And, the, the, um, and whatever, but and it points to each and every members of uh, such a stream of uh, variants. And I can do uh, any standard, uh, uh, you know, STL algorithms like STD copy or STD find, etc., with this uh, uh, iterator. And whenever I uh, uh, use the, uh, you know, the star operator, the dereference operator, I can receive back something that looks like a variant, okay, or something that I can use as a variant and, and do visitation on. So with the condensed variant iterator, I can move over or traverse a stream of many, many variants one by one. And each time I, I use the operator plus plus and move forward, I know to jump the exact correct amount, okay? And similarly, if I don't have uh, the memory uh, already or inside, the, inside my process and I want to allocate myself, I, can, uh, I also implemented a condensed variant queue, which is you know, a, a single direction queue that I can write, uh, use uh, in place back and pop front to add uh, and remove elements from. And the actual memory layout of this queue is the same memory layout that I presented in this previous slide. And this is, again, a way if I want to uh, create uh, some buffer before I send it over the network, I can use this condensed variant queue to start filling uh, uh, up information 
or thinning up variants one after another, each one in the exact same size. And then I have my whole buffer and then I can send over the network or write to disk, etc. Okay, and the basic idea and the basic uh, logic that's used for both uh, these uh, uh, mechanism use the fact that, uh, again, the, I can do visitation and the variant itself knows its own type. So this uh, uh, visit function over here, it basically has a generic lambda of type auto. And what will happen is that the compiler will actually instantiate a different implementation of the lambda for the different alternatives of my variant. And once I have this different alternative, then this code that looks at uh, p plus one, the plus one will actually know uh, to uh, increment exactly by the correct amount for the different alternative. Okay, so if I do p plus one, and uh, currently p is of type robot, it will know to jump the exact size of the robot along with alignment and all the padding and all the, the different uh, requirements. But the, the implementation uh, for a citizen or a tourist will know to jump the correct amount for a citizen or a tourist. And, and then I do a static as best back, back to the base, and, uh, and I know that I jumped exactly the right amount, and I can move along with, uh, with my traversal. Okay, so that's the way it is. Uh, you know, it's quite clear, but I should mention that uh, uh, this uh, iterator is only a forward iterator, and the queue is only a uh, one-way queue, and I can only uh, put things in the back or pop things from the front. The reason is that because the tags are in the header, okay, because each uh, uh, each of the members has its own tag placed uh, right in front of it. It's uh, it's very easy to jump forward and, and skip a member, but it, it's very hard uh, to to skip back because I don't without a tag I don't know how much to skip back. Okay, so that's uh, uh, these nice uh, utilities uh, help for um, traversing these types of uh, streams and these uh, big arrays of many many objects. Okay. So I see that uh, Klaus and, uh, forwarded the question about uh, a link to the sources. So currently, this is not uh, open source on GitHub, mainly because I'm a little shy and I don't want, uh, uh, I guess, people to uh, uh, to criticize my uh, uh, uses of uh, you know the final keyword and the override keyword and the, the various uh, uh, ways I use the lambdas. But I will definitely uh, try to open source it and. Uh, you know, I'll definitely try to post uh, uh, on, on the meetup group uh, once uh, once I manage to release this to the public. Okay, so a summary so far. What we have, I tried to show you that uh, variants and unions are similar but not the same. I tried to uh, uh, go over a little bit of cases where uh, unions already try to solve the problems that the uh, variant uh, solved in C++ 17 by placing tags in the headers. And I gave you a little bit of uh, uh, utilities and tools and talked about different approaches to use the same um, C style memory layout with the extra C++ safety. Okay, so uh, these are all uh, you know very much related things. My last uh, topic that I want to discuss is totally unrelated to uh, unions, but I think it's also nice and has to do with variants. So I'll jump into that, but again, maybe I'll stop for uh, a few seconds if someone has the questions or comments. Okay, great. So, the topic, uh, short one that I want to talk about is uh, regarding uh, devirtualization and about ways that uh, people can use variants in order to help with devirtualization. So, first of all, what is devirtualization? Again, I'm happy to uh, uh, show a link uh, uh, of Andrew Alexandrescu for when he was uh, much uh, uh, more handsome and, and young. I think this is from a uh, a conference in 2013 um, where he talked about uh, devirtualization. And basically, I, I won't, you can go and look up that talk. He describes uh, the fact that uh, virtual calls is something that has uh, a lot of benefits, but also a lot of downsides, he especially was talking about performance. And he tried to uh, show the audience an, a way that he basically creates his own small and compact uh, uh, virtual table uh, without uh, using the C++ uh, VPTR and VTable itself. And you can see, uh, if you look here, this is his, his basic implementation where he uh, write, has a, a tag of uh, only uh, eight bits, okay, just a UNT uh, tag. 
and uh, his own V table of uh, pointers to functions. And his basic idea was that uh, if, uh, if he knows uh, in compile time a smaller number or a limited number of alternatives, and he can put a very small uh, number of bits in the tag, everything is much more condensed. You can, you can access a V table in a much more condensed fashion, and he showed that it can give a better performance. When you look at this code, uh, after my talk from now and after discussing, uh, um, you know, STD variant, this all can look quite familiar, right? Um, the, S the STD variant also has a tag, and the, the STD L variant is typically uint t. And uh, when you run a STD visit, you also basically have a V table that's created for you, and the STD visit back actually jumps through the through the V table. So basically, when I uh, you know watched uh, uh, this uh, uh, blast from the past talk from 2013, um, a few months ago, I realized that all of this uh, uh, all of these tricks that uh, Alex Rescu shows, which are complicated or difficult uh, to do without variant, suddenly become uh, uh, very easy and, and much simpler. And I wondered if it makes sense in 2020 or, in, or to today to do all these types of tricks and what it might give us. So this is what uh, I'll try to show you uh, in the next few minutes. So first of all, uh, why are people so afraid of virtual functions? Okay, I, I, you know, I think it's a little bit of a controversy. It's quite common to consider virtual functions as something that uh, has a, a bad performance implications. And uh, as mentioned, even uh, Klaus a few months ago um, uh, described the, the different uh, you know, performance benefits and benefits and the and disadvantages of various approaches, including uh, virtual functions. But uh, when, when you ask people why uh, virtual functions are bad, many times they talk about branch miss predictions. And the branch miss prediction is uh, a very low level microarchitecture, uh, you know, I guess microarchitecture problem that can happen, um, which can cause uh, or which can cause some performance uh, hit. Uh, because our processors, they always they work uh, uh, you know, in parallel, and whenever they uh, run a single assembly command, they already look ahead and try to uh, pre-process and uh, decode the, the next commands that need to be uh, uh, processed. And uh, that means that uh, if, if I jump around from one place to another, if, I, if the code has a lot of if statements or a lot of uh, call statements that are uh, to different locations, it's very hard for the processor to pipeline and to look ahead and know which instructions are about to come. And uh, that's why uh, each processor does a, uh, tries to predict where each branch is trying to go and try to predict what is the stream of interactions that, that needs to work on. And many people consider these branch these predictions as something that can hurt a lot in terms of performance. Now, I have to tell you that uh, this is something that uh, many people talk about, but I don't think it's uh, branch these predictions themselves are so much of a problem. And the reason is that if you look, Many times the processors predictors are quite good, okay. And the reason that they are quite good is that the processors actually, you know, they're small and they are in silicon, but they have a lot of data in their proposal. They know your program and they also know the data as it runs. So the branch predictor actually is a small machine learning uh, component that learns from from history on each and every uh, branch that it visits how how it usually uh, behaves with the current data that it's running on. And for that reason, it's sometimes uh, relatively easy for a processor to predict where a branch will go. And this is this goes, excuse me, this goes uh, both for uh, if else statements as well as for uh, virtual uh, table calls. However, uh, compilers have a harder time uh, doing these types of things. The reason is that the compilers usually just see the program and uh, they don't see uh, the data. And many times, even the compilers don't see all the program. They, you probably maybe heard of uh, these buzzwords uh, called PGO and LTO. Okay, so PGO is profile guided optimizations, basically uh, trying to compile by and giving the compiler some data about the profiles, the benchmarks, the, the exact uh, runtime uh, or environments where I want my binary to run. And the LTO, link time optimization, is a way to tell the compiler more about the program, not just the specific uh, compilation unit, but th the full program as a way to uh, to try to also tell it what are the different uh, alternatives, which, what's the whole uh, class hierarchy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But usually people don't do PGO and don't do LTO, and that means that the compilers are in a disadvantage. 
In C++ 20, we try to help a little bit the compilers, sp specifically with if statements and switch statements, with the addition of the likely attribute. With likely, I can tell the compiler, hey, you don't know the data, you don't know a lot about the code, but I can tell you and give you a hint that this is a likely path for an if statement or a switch statement. And the virtualization is something that the compilers try to do to break through virtual calls. And, and they, if a compiler can give, have a good guess uh, which uh, specific implementation of a virtual function is going to be called in a certain place. A compiler can be very, very smart about it. It can inline uh, the, that virtual call. It can uh, look inside the, the code of the uh, of the function and, and out of it and, and do rearrange some stuff. So compiler can be very, very uh, successful at improving performance, improving the, the uh, I guess, uh, the, the performance uh, of our system and the, the binary if it can know with a good chance uh, of being correct which exact virtual function I'm going to call or which exact runtime type I have in my hand. And uh, But unfortunately, uh, it's not very easy for compilers to uh, to know this thing, and, but they work very hard. And uh, even the C++ 20 likely attribute cannot be used for virtual calls. I cannot use likely to tell it, hey, I know that my pointer is probably pointing to a specific type and not to another. And this is where variant comes in. Okay, so let's look at this uh, example um, where I have a, a basically uh, a pointer to a base and a virtual function called foo. Okay, so I have a pointer to a base and a virtual function called foo, and there are two, only two derived classes, d1 and d2. Both of them are final, and uh, one of them uh, has an implementation of a uh, foo that returns one, the other returns two. And I want to ask you. What do you think about this next code where I create a variant of D1 pointer and base pointer and I visit by calling foo? Okay, so what, was, what is going to happen here with the visitation? Right? Basically, um, let's start by looking at this uh, the second uh, uh, alternative, the base uh, uh, pointer alternative. With the, with the base pointer alternative, it's quite clear what's going to happen because uh, foo is a, is a virtual function. And, and base is not final. Um, the implementation of the visitation, in case uh, the P is of type base, will have to do an actual virtual call. But on the other hand, if uh, uh, the auto instantiation is of type D1, which is a final class, suddenly this is not a virtual call. Suddenly P arrow foo will not be virtual because in this specific implementation, I can know uh, that uh, D1 is a final class, and then thus foo will just return one. So in this uh, example, what I'm trying to say is that I can create a variant of two pointers. Its size of is just the size of one pointer as well as a tag. And the tag can help me know whether I'm going to point to a base or to D1. And in the if I'm going to point to D1, I, I think I, I hopefully will tell the compiler you can inline it. It's not virtual anymore. I can help the compiler devirtualize. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And notice that I don't do it with D2. I do it only with D1. The reason is, is because I want to give the compiler a hint that D1 is the likely uh, alternative, is the one that I want you to devirtualize. Okay, so you probably know uh, uh, a compiler explorer. So here is the, the exact, uh, the same. Uh, uh, Example in Compiler Explorer. I don't know how uh, versed you are in assembly, but let's. But it's not very long. You can see it's 22 lines of C++. Uh, we generate 23 lines of assembly. It's quite uh, quite simple, and uh, I think uh, it, it's not uh, an easy thing to look at. But I can show you that. By the way, uh, the lines uh, uh, 22 and 23. You can see there's Gen V table input. That's those two those uh, two lines 22 and 23 are the actual virtual call. Okay. I have uh, two uh, classes, common and rare. So, so this is the virtual table, and the virtual. This is the, the virtual call uh, to here, and the actual the, the, the jump in the uh, in line twenty is the call uh, to uh, to my uh, virtual uh, method. Okay, and this is virtual and not devirtualized. But here, on top of it, lines fifteen and sixteen, you can actually see a return of seven hundred and fifty. That's the common case. Okay, and basically. You can see that I managed to uh, create a differentiation to the compiler. We have one alternative, which is uh, uh, which is inlined and, uh, and not virtual, 
and another alternative, line 17 and below, which, are, which is the, an actual indirect call to a virtual function. And how does the compiler choose between this one alternative and the second alternative? That happens in, in line 11. That's the call to the STD visit visual, uh, virtual table, or yeah, that, that, that was generated by the variant. Okay, so basically this entire code here from line one to, to, uh, to 10 mostly just tries to look at the tag and check whether the tag of my uh, variant is common or not. If it's common, I can, uh, then I go and jump to my chunk table either to line 14 or 17, when either return 750 or do the virtual call. So this is nice, but not, but not a lot of uh, performance gain. Why? Because in, if my common case is, is line 14, then I don't need to pay for the indirect call in line uh, uh, 20, which is good, but I pay for the indirect call in line 11. So I basically save the one virtual call, but uh, added another indirect call, which potentially has the same uh, uh, implications and same uh, uh, performance uh, uh, costs as the virtual call. So I try to think a little deeper, and that's uh, my last slide for today. And I implemented a visit function without a virtual table. Okay. Now, even without looking at the code, I can just show you the assembly. Okay. Suddenly, certain two, 32 lines of uh, C++ turn into just uh, eight lines of assembly. Okay. Lines uh, line five is the virtual call, and line seven and eight that's the common case. Okay. So you can see. Um, basically, what I did here is that I converted my uh, visit uh, implementation to not be a uh, guaranteed constant time. STD visit is guaranteed constant time. For that reason, it has to create a virtual table and it has to do an indirect jump. I wrote here a small implementation of a uh, visit, I call it visit no table, which basically uses if and if const expert to recursively check the different indexes. If the index of my tag is the one that I'm currently, uh, uh, I guess, templated or instantiated on, then I'll call the visitor here. Else, I will do a recursive call to visit no table with index plus one. So instead of doing a, a virtual table, I'm doing an if else, if else of the different uh, indexes. So this looks like a slower uh, type of uh, visit because it's not a constant time. It, uh, it looks like it's longer. But on the other hand, compilers are, and optimizers are much better equipped to look at these types of uh, uh, if-else uh, statements and really, really optimize them. And then suddenly, uh, the, the compiler really knows, OK, I want to look at my variant as either a common or a base. Let's check SIL, see if it's a common or a base. If it's a common, let's do the virtual call. If it's a base, let's return 750. And suddenly, I, can conver I converted my uh, a virtual call into something that in many cases becomes non-virtual and, uh, and, and, and inlined, and, and the performance can be uh, much, much improved. So in cases where, for example, I have a, a pointer to a base class uh, where that has uh, two different implementations, one for production and the other for testing and integration. And in my code base, I use a variant of the production and the base class uh, where, where I call the, the, my virtual functions. And that way, I get a guarantee that the production uh, alternative gets really, really uh, good performance, gets really, really good inline. The, the processor can really, really uh, predict very nicely this jump in line three, where it goes. And once, uh, that, uh, once the, pr the processor predicts the jump in line three, everything is inline, everything is uh, sweet. And in the cases where I'm not running in production, then I don't mind. Uh, doing the full uh, virtual call and then uh, getting all the sweet stuff uh, that I need in, uh, for integration and, and for debugging purposes, we have much more complex uh, class hierarchies, etc. So that's uh, another nice trick for using uh, variants as a way to giving a compiler a hint of how to devirtualize in which of my specific uh, uh, base classes are, is actually important and should be uh, inlined. Okay, so that's my talk. I was a little bit over, but if you have any more questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer and also, of course, uh, join uh, uh, the nice uh, post-meeting uh, 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 chat. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. 
So first of all, a big thank you from all of us for giving this talk. It was an amazing talk. Thank you. Um, there's a question. Um, so this condensed variant that you showed earlier um, has the potential to use less memory for serialization. Back in the day, bandwidth was a bigger concern. Um, have you benchmarked the performance implications of this? Can you repeat the question? It has the potential of using what memory? Uh, less memory, right? Like oh. uh, it's more condensed, right? Oh, like yes. these protocols, if I understand correctly, come from a time where bandwidth was a bigger concern than today, maybe. Yeah. Um, and have you benchmarked the performance implications of um, using this condensed variant? Yeah, so uh, I have to tell you that uh, my main motivation for this was, uh, as you mentioned, not because of uh, the, the condense and the performance, but mostly because uh, that's the way uh, we receive packets uh, from the network or read them for disk. Um, but the actual, uh, uh, you know, difference is it can actually be quite high. Uh, there are many cases where um, the very common alternatives of a variant or a union are very, very small and fit inside one cache line, uh, while just a few of the uh, rare alternatives that are very, very large and they can, can cross multiple cache lines. And specifically in those cases, uh, it can be, uh, it can give a, a nice boost and we can see a dramatic uh, decrease in uh, cache uh, misses. But I, I don't have, uh, you know, I have a solid benchmark that I can share, but it, it, it can be, I think it can be good. Okay, so if I understand correctly, right, it can go both ways. It could be um, worse because it has to do more variable uh, size jumping, or it could be better because um, things are like it, uh, the prefetcher has to do less work and whatnot. Yes, yes. In, in my, uh, you know, uh, the best case for these types of things is when, uh, you know, the most, uh, when the, I guess, when the alternatives inside the, uh, the union or the variant are not uh, uniform, when there are some uh, very, very common uh, uh, alternatives and some that are very, very rare, and especially if the common ones are small, then you get a nice uh, win. Okay. Um, then the next question was, um, do you know about the compile time implications? Like, um, if it compiles slow, or like how much uh, of using this recursive template instantiation you used for the uh, last bit you showed? Oh, yeah. Um, so, basically, uh, sorry, basically, I think, uh, you know, I use it only in cases uh, where uh, uh, I really had uh, a variant of with, with two or maybe three alternatives. So, the common case and the base case, or maybe two common cases and one base case. So, uh, for that reason, the, the the compile times are actually very, very quick because it looks like there's recursion, but the recursion isn't uh, uh, too deep. Um, I, I think that, uh, again, if I open source it, I will uh, try to do some, uh, impl some implementation that uh, really tries to, I guess, uh, cons constrain the number. And if the number of uh, uh, alternatives inside my variant is, uh, is larger than some x, then I will still uh, fall back to... Uh, to, to a virtual table and to a call to STD visit, just try the first few alternatives and then uh, move uh, the other way around. I think, by the way, Klaus's talk also discussed the performance of STD visit compared to MPOWERED visit, and he also discussed the fact that uh, a common switch, uh, the, the virtu virtual table that uh, uh, STL creates is not so good in terms of performance. And he also has uh, some uh, code snippets from uh, Michael Park's implementation that also, I think, tried to uh, address this exact same problem and try to get a good performance in case we're visiting with quite a few alternatives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I remember correctly, like back in the day when standard um, variant was being standardized, Piana even wrote in papers was very critical of it. He said like he didn't believe in the design. He, he, he believed that a language variant with pattern matching was the way forward. Um, then Another question, how long did you work on that interesting topic? Um, well, you know, actually in Istra where we work, we do a lot of, uh, you know, low level types of things. So we, a lot of our, uh, I guess, protocols and a lot of our data structures are very, very similar to that. And we, we so for many, many years I had the, we, you know, we had a, a code base that uses, uh, you know, the unions and those uh, different uh, types of, uh, uh, alternatives uh, without this, and uh, this, this, uh, these last things are not so uh, complicated. I think it's in a matter of uh, a few weeks you can get the basic implementation of these things 
uh, that uh, that really works and makes uh, your world uh, much uh, much safer. And because the memory layout is practically the same as uh, the old uh, approaches, you can actually also, uh, I guess, migrate or, or refactor your code bit by bit, which is also nice. Um, another big thank you from um, all the people in chat. And I think that's the perfect moment to jump over to the after talk chat. Uh, Klaus, I think um, you already posted a link. So everyone that's still listening, um, please join us. Um, get a chance to talk to all of us, ask other, other questions, have a bit of a chat. Um, so see you there. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. I'll see you there.